I think uh, these are the uh, media mics, but it's a small room. I think you can hear me. Uh, can you hear me in the back? Okay. Okay. I will kick up the volume. Then. My name is Drew Ivers. I live in Webster City, which is about one hour north of Des Moines. Been involved in the political process for quite a long time. Very active in the Republican Party and in conservative uh, political endeavors for a number of years. And it's my uh, distinct honor to be a part of a historic campaign with this candidate. And I'm reminded uh, you know, of a, some familiar words that all of you, have, I sure, I'm sure, learned in junior high or maybe even grade school. Lincoln made the comment in the 1860s, as you know, that we were testing whether this nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. And folks, I, I believe that's applicable to the situation we're in right now. We're testing the strength of our Constitution. Can we retain and sustain and promote and deliver the Constitution that our founders gave us and that our forefathers preserved and protected and passed down to us? And this campaign is all about that. And I believe we have not only the, the champion, he is the champion of the Constitution, he is a statesman, and he is a leader that to, for the people to govern themselves, self-government. And that's what our republic is all about, that we govern ourselves, and that you are the ones that do that through your representative. And that's what representative government's all about. And that's what Ron Paul is all about. To restore the strength to the people through the representative form of government as, as laid out for us very well by the Constitution. So it is my distinct pleasure and privilege and honor to introduce to you the Honorable Congressman Ron Paul. to get control of the government to divide the wealth. And they've been doing it 
And uh, when a problem comes, <clears throat> when a problem comes, generally speaking, these powerful special interests can get their bailouts and dump the problems on us. And this certainly happened in 2008. These were predictable events. They've been coming along for a long time. The bubble was readily apparent by those who have studied free market economics, and, uh, and this problem has been building. Actually, in recent times, it's been building since 1971, because <clears throat> since 1971, <clears throat> excuse me, there has been no restraint on the federal government spending, because um, usually the restraints are you can't raise taxes anymore. People get mad about taxes. They might want more government. Can't keep raising taxes, so they couldn't do that. So then they started borrowing a lot. There's a limit to that, or interest rates go up. So then, what do they do? They resort to just printing the money. And the founders understood this issue very clearly. They had runaway inflation at the beginning of our history, and <clears throat> what they said was uh, only uh, gold and silver could be legal tender, and you couldn't print paper money. And uh, by 1971, we delinked the dollar from gold, and we spent that we could print money endlessly, secretly, with the Federal Reserve. Quite frankly, we don't need the Federal Reserve. It hasn't been authorized in the Constitution. We could be without the Federal Reserve, but the very least that we have to do is audit and find out what the Federal Reserve has been doing. But since this time, the government continued to grow, and the debt got so big that then the bubble burst, and the very people who had so much control uh, then got the bailouts, the bad debt that was accumulated with the derivatives markets and the, and the mortgages, that was all dumped on the people. Congress bought them, and, and, the, tra and then, uh, the Federal Reserve bought them. In, in, a, in, in a correction, an economic correction, when things get out of whack, you have to get rid of the debt, you have to get rid of the mistakes, but if you prop them up and just take them from one group and give them to another group, you never get economic growth again, and that's why we're stagnating at this time. So what I advocate is changing our policies, and uh, it's not like I've invented new policies or they're my policies. Uh, what we have done is our country has drifted from the policies that made us great. And that was limited government, personal liberty, sound money, free markets, property rights, contract rights, and a sensible foreign policy. And we've drifted so far from that that restoration of that seems to be, you know, an overwhelming task. But we've got into this mess, whether it's the endless wars overseas or whether it's the economic conditions that we have here uh, in, in our economy now, uh, we, we got there by not following the Constitution. So I, I just have a very strong suggestion. If somebody sent people to Washington who believe in the Constitution, take their oaths of office seriously, and obey the Constitution. That is what I think we need. How do you go from here? I think the American people are waking up and they've come to this agreement that this needs to be done. The people are starting to demonstrate in the streets, both on the right and the left. They're saying something's out of whack. The special interests are in charge and they're getting the benefits. So what are we going to do about it? Well, nothing happens in Washington if the people's attitudes don't change. If the, people, if the, people, if the consensus of the people is that we have this moral obligation to be in every country in the world, to police the world, and to be involved in all the military activities overseas, uh, we can't change. If, if you think it's the responsibility of government <clears throat> to uh, take care of us from cradle to grave, it can't be changed. So we have to change these things in order to change the uh, spending levels. The um, foreign policy has to be changed. I think it's the easiest place to cut spending. If you come to the conclusion that we cannot sustain $1.4 trillion debts every year, or $15 trillion national debt, $3 trillion that we owe overseas, why don't we cut in the easiest place? Why don't we find something where we can bring liberals and conservatives and moderates and independents together? Instead of picking on maybe child health care or the elderly in this country, why don't we look to the overseas spending? This overseas spending, the military spending overseas, I am absolutely convinced does not make us a safer nation. Money spent in military is not necessarily defense money. There's two different things. Military money, sometimes it's just military mischief. Defense money is quite different. 
this is why I want to change the foreign policy and change the spending overseas. I think we're in way too many wars, and it's time to change that and start bringing our military home to protect this country. A lot of people say, well, that sounds like you're weak on national defense. You don't want to defend this country. But if we're, if we're so involved in, say, the boundaries between uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, which is uh, an impossible task to figure that out and figure out all the problems that have been going on over there for thousands of years, uh, at the same time, not even being concerned about our borders of our own country, there's a war going on on our southern border. There's over 40,000 people have been killed there uh, in the last five years, and uh, it's a mess. At the same time, we're so engaged overseas. So just bringing the troops home would be an economic boost. Well, why, why are we still having troops maintained in Japan? You know, World War II's been over for a few years now, and I think it's time we bring them home. Why do we have troops in South Korea? Why do we have troops in Germany? We, we subsidize their economies by doing that. They might have more social programs. The fact that we pay for their defense, they spend more in their social programs, and we suffer the consequences because this country is broke. I mean, we can't afford to take care of our own people. This, this whole game that we play with Social Security, there's actually no money in the bank. Uh, but, you know, we shift, we borrow, we spend, we print money, and we try to convince people everything is going to be okay. But, quite frankly, it isn't okay, and we have to change. So what I want to do in the first year is to do something which I think is rather modest because it's so necessary. You'd have to do it if it were your budget. And that is, I want to cut a trillion dollars out of our spending in one year. Yeah. All right. This would mean that we would have to, have to change our foreign policy. But it also means people will get very nervous. Well, what about the domestic spending? Where, where are you going to cut? How can you cut and get, get a whole trillion dollars in one year? And uh, I, I think we should pick our priorities the places where we don't want to cut. Uh, the country in the 30s made a contract with the people, and they broke the contract. But the contract was, you pay into this fund. It's an insurance fund, and we'll take care of you, and you'll get your money back plus interest uh, when you retire. Well, so far, it's, the, the checks are still coming, but the value of the money isn't, isn't there. The standard of living is going down for people on retirement because we cheat by just devaluing the currency, print up the money, the value goes down, and the people don't keep up. So real, in real terms, it's actually going down. So if we want to maintain, say, Social Security and medical benefits for the elderly, medical care for the indigent and the children, there's only one way you can do it, and that is cut significantly overseas and never have to sacrifice defense. That is how I'm convinced of it. We will also require spending cuts here at home. And I've listed the priorities I think that we should aim to protect, because someday I'd like to work our way out of this and go back completely uh, to, to the Constitution. But the places where we should cut, the one thing that, <clears throat> that we have to stop immediately, because they're still ongoing, is no more bailouts of the big companies and the big banks. That's at least we'd stop the bleeding. <laughs> the dollar crisis that's going on, the financial crisis, is just as bad, if not worse, than it was in 2008. And all you have to do is pick up the papers and look at what you hear about Europe. The European currency is in trouble. There's a huge amount of debt that indirectly we're involved in because our banks have, uh, have branches over there and uh, there's an interest in everybody to propping up the dollar so they don't want Europe to collapse. But they all owe this, they own this debt, they own Greek debt. But right now, our Federal Reserve has gone over and assured that they will be available to bail out Greek debt by propping up these banks. They give money, our central bank gives money to the European Central Bank, the European Central Bank gives this money to the banks, and the banks owe this big debt, and they don't want them to go bankrupt. But let me tell you, the, the people who have overextended themselves, they deserve to go bankrupt. You don't deserve to go bankrupt, and that's what they're doing. That's why we have to stop this. So once we stop the bailouts, that still doesn't solve the problem. We have to cut some other money. 
And I would cut whole departments, some of the departments that were never authorized in the Constitution. They do not serve our interests. No matter how much you might argue that there's some benefits that have come from the Department of Education, quite frankly, it's unconstitutional, has not really benefited us, and I'd like to just get rid of the Department of Education. <laughs> departments and counting uh, a lot of this overseas spending isn't enough. You still have to change the budget level. And the budget level that I have picked to go back to is 2006. And uh, no, nobody complained about government uh, being um, you know, too big at that time, uh, uh, too small at that time. It was way too big then. I'm just going back you know, five years. And if you do that, that would cut all the budgets. But if we don't do something like this, Everybody's check's going to bounce, whether you're a veteran getting benefits or whether you're on Social Security or Medicaid. The, jet, the wealth won't be there because we're not a wealthy country. On the surface, we're wealthy, but underneath, it's all debt. It's, 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 there's a huge debt burden. So the real challenge that I offer is what kind of a country do we want? Do we want to concentrate on continuing what we have, the status quo, and just say, we can do it. We can tax the rich and pass out more money. We can borrow more money. We can print more money. It's not going to work. And that's what this economy is telling us right now. That's what this financial condition around the world is telling us. And our answers are available. It's sound economic policy. It's following the Constitution. It's coming up with a sensible foreign policy. Uh, the sensible foreign policy to me is staying out of the internal affairs of other nations. Another way to decide when to go to war. Uh, how about constitutionally? What about this unique idea about not going to war unless the people have their members of Congress vote and declare the war? Wow. We've been going to war carelessly and casually uh, for a long time, ever since World War II. World War II, we were attacked, Germany declared war against us, Congress declared war, the war was fought in uh, four years, and uh, the war was won. It was a major achievement. But since then, we just slip and slide. Instead of going to the Congress, what was the very thing, very early after World War II, uh, Truman didn't go to the Congress, he went to the United Nations. And the United went to war under the United Nations banner in Korea. Vietnam, uh, in Vietnam, we didn't have a declaration of war, and we haven't had any since then. But sometimes there's consultation, sometimes there isn't with the Congress. Just recently, we were very much involved, spent a couple billion dollars, in being, and we're still involved in, in Libya. Uh, but there was no, it was decided by the president. The president's not supposed to do this. The founders, and this was one of the reasons we fought the Constitution, and they explicitly said, no wars without a declaration of war. Of, of war. But we've been involved in, in uh, propping up dictators, and for a while it seems to work. But what about the dictator in, in Egypt? We, we pumped in Mubarak over the many, many decades about $40 billion. And we were buying friendship and buying friendship for Israel. But guess what? It fell apart. The people finally got annoyed, and they got rid of that dictator, and he was our dictator, and uh, now we have turmoil in that country. And guess what? The radicals are very much likely to get in charge. And they're more uh, likely to be very unfriendly to Israel. So these things, these things backfire us, fire us on uh, after a period of time. But the region is really in, in chaos. And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the problems we've had have gone on a long, long time. So I think we would uh, be much better off taking the advice of the founders and said, just stay out of the entangling alliances. And some people said, throw up their hands and say, oh, you mean that means isolationism? We don't want to deal with the world? No, really exactly the opposite. The very people who want to be involved in the next war, who are putting on sanctions on countries unnecessarily, stirring up trouble, are the ones who call me an isolationist. I don't like these sanctions. You're just looking for trouble. If you put sanctions on our country, what if they put a blockade on us down in the Gulf of Mexico and uh, said you can't even import uh, certain goods and services? We consider that an act of war. But here we are putting sanctions on, uh, on, on uh, Iran right now, and they're getting pretty nervous. And they say, well, if you do that, we're going to retaliate. But sanctions are acts of war. 
This is what we did for, um, for uh, uh, Iraq for years, since 1998 up to 2003. I tried my best to not go to war against Iraq, believing it was foolish, it would be costly, and they weren't an enemy, there was no al Qaeda, and they had no weapons of, of mass destruction. But what did we do there? For 10 years, we were bombing Iraq and putting on sanctions. Madeleine Albright actually admitted 500,000 children died in Iraq when we bombed up their infrastructure. And uh, she was asked about it, and, and she says, well, that's the cost, that's what it has to be. Do you think, how would we react if somebody did to that? I think there's a simple way to solve all this. Why don't we encourage people to think about foreign policy under the golden rule? Don't do anything to any other country that we don't want them to do to us, and that would solve a lot of our problems. We live in a great country. We had the greatest document. We had the freest country ever, and we had the greatest prosperity and the biggest middle class. But the middle class is shrinking. In the last 10 years, 30 million new people, uh, uh, population growth in this country. No significant new manufacturing jobs. The general jobs have gone overseas. We now have uh, the wealthy being bailed out. We have people, 46 million people on food stamps. The jobs aren't available. And all our effort to do good, where there's, there's always a good reason for us to go over and help people overseas. But even domestically, the housing bubble was based on a lot of people who sincerely wanted to make sure everybody had a house, even if the government had to subsidize it and force loans and give low, you know, low interest loans. And uh, lo and behold, uh, a lot of people had houses, but the bubble burst bailed out those who made a lot of money. At the same time, the middle class lost their jobs. The people we were supposed to help, they lost their houses. So the, same, the same thing has happened in education. Federal government takes over. Everybody deserves a college education. I think it would be great. People who want a college education should be available. In the old days, not too many years ago, it wasn't too difficult because the cost was lower, jobs were available, and a person, if they didn't have their parents take care of them, they could work their way through. That's virtually impossible today. The cost has skyrocketed because of the inflation. At the same time, the jobs aren't really available. So then the government comes in and they subsidize all this. And uh, now we have thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, graduating from college. They have degrees, and they're not trained to do the jobs that are available. There's technology jobs available in this country. They're asking us to open up the doors for bringing people in because our people aren't trained. So we have all these people graduating, and guess one thing that they do have? They have debt. The graduates in college today know owe $1 trillion. That's more than all our credit card debt. And they, they now uh, are, are suffering the consequences because we don't have jobs for them. So this is why we have to straighten out the economy, because to get people out from underwater like this is, uh, the students, I'm sure, want to pay their debts now, but they have to get a job. And this is why we have to understand the business cycle. The business cycle comes not as a consequence of free markets, as a consequence of government intervention, mischief for the special interest. It's the inflation of the Federal Reserve that causes the boom, that causes the inevitable bust, booms and busts, that is caused by the Federal Reserve system. So this is the reason why we have to look at spending, the nature of government, the role of government, as well as, as our foreign policy. But we have to restore a bit of confidence in ourselves, our understanding of our history, and how, how well we thrived when we had more self-reliance. Uh, the idea, the concept, that we got our rights and our lives as a gift from our God, and therefore, at one time, we thought that if you worked hard, you got to keep what you earned. And I would like to restore that. If you have a right to your life and your liberty, you ought to have a right to keep the fruits of your labor. It's yours to keep and spend your way you want to spend. And it's with that incentive that people will go back to work. If there's a dependency, the government will be always there to take care of us. And there is a system where a high-paid lobbyist can produce more for a corporation that will be to create a good product. It will happen. But it's ending because you can't pay the bills anymore. And that is why this country has changed, even in the last four years. The erosion of our liberties have occurred for a long period of time. But in the last four years, a big difference. 
Your financial bubble burst. People know there's a serious problem in the economy. They're sick and tired of the wars. The whole, the whole nature ha has changed uh, in, in this country. And uh, the big question is, is which way are we going to go? Are we going to have more government? Because there are people there that want more government. They say, well, there's going to be a threat. There's uh, demonstrations now. So we better pre be prepared. And we have to worry about the breakdown of law and order. <coughs> But the government, our government's been going in the wrong direction, especially since 9-11. They have decided that you had too much liberty, and therefore what we needed to do to solve them a problem, solve the problem of a threat by those who would like to do us harm, is take away your privacy. So they passed the Patriot Act, which is, the re which is essentially repealing the Fourth Amendment. If they would have called it the Fourth Amendment repeal, it wouldn't have passed. But because it was the Patriot Act, nobody could vote against it, and here we are 